I want to welcome you to Southgate Bible class here this evening. We are in the book of Ephesians. Tonight we are going to start with verse 7 and go down to verse 16. So if you have the time and the opportunity, just sit down at a table there and open up your Bible. There is a handout that's available on the daily handout as well that you can copy if you like to copy or follow along if you pull it up there on your device as well. We have been talking about unity the last two weeks. And what we found is that unity starts with our attitudes, that we are to be humble, gentle, patient, and bearing with one another in love. And then we found out that there were seven things that we as the church are to be united on, and that is the one body, which is the church, the one spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, the one hope that we have of salvation in heaven itself. Then we have one Lord who is Jesus Christ, one faith, that's your set of doctrine, one baptism, which is water baptism, and one God and Father of all. Now, I want you to think about where we're going tonight. There's been a period of time that Paul has established the Ephesian church, and then he's left. They've had to rely on memory, or they have had to rely on a gift of prophecy from someone in their congregation. He wrote this letter, and they're just now getting this letter. So there's been a period of time that they've not had God's Word, as you and I have it here. And I have to wonder, how long did it take him to find out what he wrote to the Galatians? And how long did it take for him, them to find out what he wrote to the Philippians? And how long did it take for them to find out what he wrote to the Thessalonians? You see, it took a period of time for the New Testament to be compiled like what you and I now have it. So in many aspects, things are simpler for you and me than it was for them. So the church is in its early years, and how is the church going to get through those early years? How is the church going to know what to do? How is the church going to be united? Well, that's what he's going to deal with in verses 7 through 16 here this evening. Before we read this and actually take a look at it, I'd like to stop and have a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we enter into this study, we ask that you open our eyes to realize just exactly what took place back in that day and time, and how that it is so applicable to us here today as well. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us to be mindful that the church is so valuable, that it is so important, that one of the purposes of those that work within the church is to build the body up so that we all can reach unity in the faith. I ask that you will help us to be mature individuals. Help us to understand just exactly what we need in order to do to please you. Help us to speak just simply what your word has to say. Yes, we ask and pray that in this day and time that the church would be united upon what your word does say. Tonight we want to thank you for what Jesus Christ means to us. We know that he is the head of the church. Help each one of us to do our part as we serve you on a day-by-day basis and make our life uh, a a true example to those that are around about us. Tonight, I once again ask you to continue to be with those that are suffering from illnesses, sicknesses, and diseases. We ask that you be with those that are confined to home. And it's our prayer also that you'll help us to get back to the point where we can come back together again and in order to share God's Word in person with one another. Uh, We certainly miss doing that. I pray you'll be with the people that uh, 
hear what we have to say tonight from your word. And we just pray that uh, great fruit will be developed from that. As always, we ask you to forgive us of our shortcomings. Open our eyes to see what we've done wrong. Open our eyes to see opportunities in front of us to share your message. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Beginning in verse 7, chapter 4 of Ephesians. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Until we all reach unity... Think back to the early days of the church. And here's one man says A, and here's one man that says B. How do you know to, which one to go with? How can you be united when he says A and he says B? Well, I want you to see that Jesus Christ is going to provide the way that indeed unity could be there. And he's gone to use people in order to do that. And so as you start this chapter, you see unity is the theme, and it's very, very important, but it was also very difficult to do. Paul had to write Galatians and also part of Colossians about people that were saying things that were wrong. Well, there were people there that believed what they were saying. And he had to point out to him that's not what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. He had to write in 1 Corinthians about people that had wrong ideas and they were creating division. Well, the Lord didn't leave us helpless. He himself was going to see that the truth was there and then it's up to us to follow that truth. So as we start off, he says that there is something that has been given to each one of us, and what is that? It's grace. Jesus Christ is given that grace. And he's got to quote a verse from the Old Testament, and that verse is Psalm 68 and verse 18, which says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. So as he ascended back to heaven, and this was referring to Jesus, he led captives and gave gifts to men. What did he lead captive? Well, there's a, a lot of different things that are thought about here, and, and yet I will have to admit that this is a difficult verse to really know exactly all that's being said there. Uh, I've read a lot of different commentaries, and most commentators will also say we don't know all that is meant by that. 
but he has led captive prisoners. Uh, that would be, I believe, spiritual enemies. may very well mean sin itself or death itself. These are things that are now under the power and the control of Jesus Christ. The second thing which is easier to understand is that he gave gifts to men. And as we begin to hit verse 11, you're going to see what these gifts and what these abilities were. It was to some individuals, but in reality it was for all people. So I want you to see that Jesus hasn't left us helpless. And I think that's also what he was saying to his uh, disciples in his prayer in John chapter uh, what, 15, 16, and 17, that I'm going to go away, but I'm not going to leave you helpless, that I'm going to send the comforter, I'm going to send the counselor, the Holy Spirit, who is going to guide you. And so, yes, it was early days, and yes, it was a difficult predicament to be in, and yet truth could still be known. So gifts are going to be given. I also believe that that certainly could apply to the gift of the Holy Spirit, which was certainly different than the previous time frame. That when we were told that we could repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that that is a gift that God has given to us as well. It talks about that if He ascended, that means that He has descended. So when you understand about Jesus, He was in heaven. Now He's going back to heaven. Well, what does that mean? It means He had to come down to earth in between. And so, if He has ascended, that means that He had descended. That means He did come to this earth. Jesus has gone to give some gifts. A few comments about gifts here to start with. These things are going to be given by the Lord. They're not something that you go out and you seek. If they are given to you, they should be used by you. They are not a source for our egos, but it is a gift. It is not something that we have earned. It is not something that we deserved, but it is a gift. So there is that idea of grace again back in verse 7. To each one of us, grace has been given. Well, what did he give? In verse 11, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So there's four or five things there, depending upon how that you are going to translate that. Well, the first thing that I want us to look at is the word apostle. He gave some to be apostles. Now, Paul's one of those. As you know, he chose 12 men to be apostles. And one of those, the betrayer, Judas Iscariot, gave up his place. Matthias was chosen to take his place. So now you're up to saying that there were 13 men. And then you have the apostle Paul who was called on the road to Damascus to be his apostle as well. So there's a total of 14 of these men. The idea of an apostle is one cent. Paul will call himself an apostle in many of the letters that he has written. And he's not just saying that, well, that means you just got to listen to everything that I say. He's saying that that is a gift that has been given to me. I have been sent and he specifically was sent to the Gentiles to preach. Now, this is important. How did you become an apostle? Well, you were chosen by the Lord. Jesus handpicked those twelve. And then in Acts chapter 1, where they are replacing Judas Iscariot, it says they cast lots, but the Lord chose, the Lord decided. Matthias. And then the Lord chose Paul on the road to Damascus. But as they were choosing Matthias, 
the other 11 men said this, we've got to pick somebody that has been with us from John's baptism to the ascension and that they are an eyewitness of the resurrection. So now I ask this question, are there those today that are eyewitnesses of the baptism of John all the way up to the resurrection and ascension of Jesus? The answer to that is no. So there are people today that are calling themselves apostles, but they're not what the Scripture teaches that apostles are. We find about these men in Acts chapter 1 and verse 5 that they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. They had the entirety of the Holy Spirit. And when you go to uh, 1 Corinthians and you see in chapters 13 and 14 the list of what these gifts are, I believe that means that they had the ability to do all of these things. All of those things in order to convey the proper, true message of Jesus Christ. It means that they were able to perform miracles. And 2 Corinthians 12, 12 shows you that's one of the marks of the apostles, be able to perform those miracles. There is nothing that gives us any indication that no, anyone ever succeeded these men. The only one that succeeded was Judas Iscariot who gave up his position. Matthias took that, but that's the end of that. These were important men. We know some things about what Paul did. We know some things about Peter did, but most of these men... It's somewhat lost to us in history that there are some traditions that we've looked at in the past about where these men may have gone and what they may have done and how they uh, uh, met their death. But these are men that were important. That wherever they went, you knew that they were saying what Jesus Christ wanted said and they were teaching what the gospel was all about. The second thing, he gave some to be prophets. Well, the first question, and you've heard me ask this question many a times down through my years here. And I think sometimes I'm having a hard time getting the, the message across. But what simply is a prophet? Don't tell me it's just someone that tells the future. Can they tell the future? Yes. You look at uh, Daniel or Ezekiel or Isaiah. These are people that, yes, can tell what the future says, and they do that on occasions. But what a prophet really is is just simply a spokesman for God, one that is telling you what God says. If it's about here and now, fine. And if God wants to reveal what's going to happen in the future, fine. But it's just simply a person that's gone to say what God once said. Now in the early days of the church, this was one of the uh, spiritual gifts. You find that in Romans chapter 12 and verse 6. And also in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10. Well, what was the purpose of that gift? What were they to be doing with that? In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3, you were to speak to men for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Well, where does that all come from? Because I know that you're a spokesman from God, that what you are saying comes from God. Now, they did have to be careful because there were people that were false prophets. They would say, here's what God told me, when in reality God had not told them. It was a spiritual gift. And the reason that that was needed, again, is you did not have your New Testament compiled as you and I now have it. So they had to know, what does God want me to do? What is God's expectations for the church? Because you had these prophets, 
you knew exactly what God wanted to be accomplished. Once the New Testament was there, once it was once for all delivered, there was no longer the need for that because we can pick up God's Word and we can see exactly what God does want. The third thing that he says, a gift that was there, was an evangelist. Evangelist is just simply someone that preaches God's Word. Uh, Quite often when we think of that word, we think about someone that traveled from place to place to place. And certainly there are those that did that. Even in the early days, uh, I'm mindful of uh, the, the South Point congregation, they would tell me about a man that would come down there, I think once a month, and preach for them. Come in on a horse, stay all day on Sunday, and after Sunday night, get on his horse and travel back to his home. Well, he'd be somewhere else the next Sunday, somewhere else the next Sunday, probably one Sunday a month that he went to that location. But he was always going somewhere. Uh, People somewhat have in their mind someone like that being an evangelist. But it's just someone that's simply teaching what God's Word says. Their primary work is to share the gospel. Uh, A lot of times when we think about that, it's taking the gospel where the gospel has not been. Of course, in our day and time, we refer to that as a missionary quite often. But that's the ideal, is just preach what God's Word says. Are there those that are evangelists today? Yes, there are teachers of God's Word today. So yes, they are evangelizing. They are telling the people the good news about Jesus Christ so that they can accept that and receive salvation. The next phrase is that there are pastors and teachers. What I find in my research is that A great many people, because of the way that it is comprised in the original language, feels like those two words are going together. I cannot say personally for a fact whether that's the case or not the case, but we're going to look at that, and and I'm going to somewhat separate that, but it may very well be one and the same, the way that it's being used there. What is a pastor? Well, it's simply... An elder, a shepherd, an overseer, or a bishop. You find those words being used. In Acts chapter 20 and verses 17 and also down to verse 28, these men that were to lead these congregations were called shepherds and overseers of the flock. A pastor. In Acts chapter 14 verse 23 they appointed elders in every church so every congregation was to have those men that were gone to lead it there were qualifications given within God's word as to what it would take in order to be an elder in 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 several words used there they're called elders there they're called shepherds there They're called overseers of the flock. All of those are words that in reality have the concept of the idea of pasture. They are the ones that are guiding the sheep, the flock. Do we have pastures today? Yes. Now I also believe that that word is very much misused today. It's not just a preacher. It is possible for a preacher to be a pastor. That's not typically the way we see it in this day and time. But it is very possible for that to take place. But it is the leaders of that local congregation. Now when we think about the word teacher, we think about someone that's just simply gone to instruct what God's word does say. So you have taken what you have learned and you are passing that on to someone else. And that's what was said to uh, Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Paul said, what was learned from me pass on to other reliable men who could then pass it on to other reliable men. So there is a teaching that is taking place. 
Can you have a pastor teacher? Pastor dash teacher. Well, I think that's exactly what Paul was writing about when he talked about elders that were worthy of double honor. They led the congregation and they also taught the congregation. You also see that in the qualifications for an elder, the phrase apt to teach. In other words, you want to teach. You have the ability to teach. That's one of the things to look at when you begin to point someone into that role. So when I look at this, I believe that apostles and the prophets were used to get from the very beginning to the time that you had God's Word in its entirety to rely upon so that there would be no gap, there would be no questions whatsoever. And that now that you do have those that are evangelists, you now have those that are pastors, teachers, that are proclaiming God's Word, now that we have God's written Word as well. So there was a transition And so these gifts were given so that why? We could have unity in the faith. We could all know exactly what the Lord wanted us to do. Now, what were these men going to do? It's going to give us some things here that they were going to do. And the first thing that it says is to prepare God's people or to equip God's people for works of service. make any difference whether it's an apostle, a prophet, a pastor, a teacher, evangelist. They all have one goal, and that is so that God's people would know what to do in order to best serve God. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, it talks about that God will equip you with everything good for doing His will. And He has used men to be able to do that. So the Apostle John, what did he want? He just simply wanted you to know what God's Word says and to do that and to serve God with the way you lived your life. You can go down to Philip the Evangelist. What was Philip wanting to do? Tell people what to do in order to serve God. What acts of service that their life could be all about to bring honor and glory to God. We find that Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, about Scripture. What's the purpose of Scripture? That the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we got Scriptures now, and we can study those Scriptures so that you can know what's good work and that you are equipped to do those good works. The leaders of the church were there to help members of the church be servants. When we stand before you as a teacher, we stand before you and present a sermon, what we are wanting is there to be something that takes place in your life that allows you to serve God even better than what you're doing. I believe that this is stressing to us and pointing out to us here that every member of the church is to be involved in the work of the church. It's not just we pick out some men to be elders and we pick out some men to be ministers. It is every person has work to do within the church. Every person is to be serving somehow, some way. The second thing that it says that these men were to do was to allow the body of Christ to be built up. That word built up is the word we use sometimes of edification. Everything we are supposed to be doing is to be making one another stronger. Are you a stronger Christian today than you were a year ago? Compare your Christian life with now and five years ago. Are you stronger? Have you been built up? In Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, it talks about what God's Word can do. God's Word can build you up and give you an inheritance. Have you been built up by God's Word? 
the third thing that was to be accomplished by what these men did until you reach unity in faith. Oh, as we already mentioned, there were some false teachers at that time. We need to know what truth is. These men were there to guide you to what truth is. Now, once you realize that you have the entire Word of God, you understand that no longer would there be the apostles, and no longer would there be the prophets, because you've got God's Word, and God's Word will build you up. The teachings of the evangelists and the pastors, the teachers, would all be united because they're all going to be in those early days guided by the Spirit up until the time came that we had our New Testament. And once again, when it talks about reaching the unity in the faith, is being used in the same way that we looked at it last week, being unified in our doctrine, the set of beliefs that we have. The fourth thing that he's going to say is that these men will bring us to unity in the knowledge of the Son of God. Again, today, where are you going to find that knowledge? Well, it's in God's Word, and only in God's Word. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, Paul talks about that I want to know. Well, that's the idea we need to have. We want to have a growing process in our life that we can do exactly what God wants done. And we know that, and can do that because we know what God's Word does say. And the fifth purpose that these men had was so that we could become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Well, what is our goal? What would be maturity? I like the phrase in Romans 8, verse 29, to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. Now you can see how that applies with everything we've been looking at. Going back to the first three verses, humble, gentle, patience, bearing with one another in love. Are we maturing in those things? Are we growing in these things? Then looking at those seven ones, are we growing in our understanding in each of those seven things? Our maturity should be like what John said in 1 John 2, 6. We're going to walk as Jesus did. These men, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, all had these purposes behind their life. And today, as we think about ministers and we think about Bible class teachers, we think about teachers, whether it be individual or in groups, we're saying, we want you to be built up. We want you to know what to do in order to work to serve God. We want you to be unified in the faith, and we want you to have knowledge that brings about unity in God, and we want you to become mature. We want you to grow up and what God's Word does say. Now, if we will do those things, what will the results be? Number one, he says, we will no longer be infants. Well, what does he mean by that? He has a little illustration. No longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind. Well, we go this way one day, and we go this way another day. I can't make up my mind. Well, this is right today. Tomorrow, I've heard somebody say something. Well, that was wrong. We wishy-washy, back and forth, doing this, that, and the other thing. He simply says that we need to grow up. Now, he's also saying that there were some that were 
deceived. Have you ever heard one person speak about some subject and he said, I agree, I agree, I agree. And then a short time later, you hear someone else speak about the same subject and says something different. And, well, I agree with what they're saying. You can't make up your mind. Well, when we really focus upon what God's Word says, we're going to lose that. And there are some that are deceiving. Some that are using their cunning. Some that are using their craftiness. And some that just simply are trying to trick you into doing what is wrong. Some just trying to get you to follow them. Don't be deceived. And if you'll know what God's Word says, you won't get there. The second result is that you are going to speak the truth in love. This is a very valuable phrase to me. Uh, there's things I can think about in my past that, that uh, I realized that this was not done. And I think of some, I think, severe consequences because of that. So I ask two questions here. Can the truth be spoken without love? Oh, yes. I can think of instances where I've known where people with a smile on their face have told someone that they're lost and going to hell. You're not going to change someone. You're not going to convince someone by doing that. You need to speak the truth always, but you need to do it in a very loving, caring, concerning way. The second question I ask you is, can you be loving and not have the truth? Oh, there's some wonderful people out there that uh, are very nice to be around, that are very appreciative of you, that are just showering you with gifts possibly. But the fact of the matter is, is that what they are teaching and preaching is wrong. It's contrary to what God's Word does say. So it takes both of these things. You've got to speak the truth, but you've got to have a loving spirit about yourself. That's part of what growing up in Christ is. The third thing that he says is that then in all things we will grow up into the head. How do you view your life? In Philippians 1.21, Paul says for... Me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I want to live for Christ. Everything about my life is serving Christ. Is that where we have come to in our life? Paul would also say in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. It's as if Paul died. And I think it's kind of easy to see that in Paul's life because he was Saul, and in reality Saul died and Paul came to life. Paul is the one that wants to know what Christ is all about. He wants to allow him to be his head. He wants him to be his Lord. Do we think like that in our lives? I have given myself up in order to serve God. And the fourth thing that he says is that because of what these men would do, that the body will grow and build itself up. These principles apply so much to today. Do you want to see our congregation grow? Do you want to see more people find salvation? then put into effect what's being said here within this passage. And I cannot help but point this out to you. It will grow. It will be joined and held together by every supporting ligament. It will build itself up in love. But now here's the key to it also. As each part does its work. If we want to be the church that we're supposed to be, then every member of the church 
needs to be working somehow, some way. That's what it takes for a church to function as God intended for it to. So, when Jesus left, it says that he gave gifts to men. There are those specific ones there in those four or five categories that we have talked about. Certainly we know that by what he did, we have the gift of salvation. We have the gift of his Holy Spirit at the time of our baptism. But I also believe that there are gifts as far as you and I are concerned still today. In Romans chapter 12, and this is verses 6 through 8, there are some gifts that are going to be mentioned there. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in the proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. What gift do you have? I very much believe that each and every one of us has some type of a gift. What is your gift? And how are you serving Lord? And how are you helping other people to be involved in the work of service as well? 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. Each one of us should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various form. What gift do you have? Might it be trying to organize people? Might it be hospitality? Might it be visitation? Might it be knowledge and using that knowledge or sharing that knowledge with people? Might it be mercy? Might it be love? Might it be wisdom? What is it that God's allowed you to be good at? How are you using that to serve God and to serve His body? There's some very valuable lessons for us to think about in this particular passage. And it helps you to understand the importance of each one of us in the body. Well, we're going to close there for tonight, and next week we'll begin with verse 17 and continue on here into the book of Ephesians, and we're going to see some things that, yes, we must do to live the Christian life. I want to thank you for listening tonight.